Ben, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Dean and I have really enjoyed your posts and your Instagram and TikTok presence um, and how you simplify the neuroscience of behavior, uh, uh, just being a human being at this day and age and uh, try to bust some myths about brain. And so we were looking forward to speaking with you about your work and about how your your day goes as as a neuroscientist and you know what your interests are so really excited to be here yeah it's yeah. um one of the things we we really enjoy is um reason based um content and and i always say i love TikTok and social media as much as people think it's got a lot of bad which is 99.9 percent .9%. but as pinker says the stickiness of reason and those that can create the content for reason is so powerful that will always come to the surface. So we we believe that what we're hearing from you is just that, which is a content that's driven by by not so much biases, which we all have to some extent, but by by good arguments, good reason based arguments, circumspect, not not overstated, not over extrapolated, which is very often. <laughs> and so that that's why we wanted to kind of have this conversation. Hopefully, many others. Um, um, and you're kind of in our field, uh, neuroscience, which we like absolutely. <laughs> quite a bit. So lo love this conversation. Awesome. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. I, I do my best, you know, to be objective and just, you know, present only empirical evidence, right? It's it's yes. simple as a scientist, you know, there's evidence for this, there's no evidence for this. Okay, why would I ever present this thing with no evidence, you know? Yes. But unfortunately, on social media, there are a lot of pressures and incentives to present that thing with no evidence, not for me, but for most creators, right? Whatever is yeah. going to be the most exciting, compelling, jaw-dropping. And so, unfortunately, uh, you don't see a whole lot of, of that sort of empirical, valid presentation, information presentation. So I do my best to contribute, and I really appreciate you uh, acknowledging that. Oh, so Thank true. You. And I know that it takes a long time to do so. It's so easy to say something without any evidence, unfortunately. You know, people just say things, and it just kind of catches like wildfire, and it's disseminated uh, profusely. But it takes a long time for scientists and people who care about evidence to bring everything back to center and show the nuance and the complexity of the picture. So I really appreciate what you do. Tell us how you got interested in, in neuroscience, like what made you go into this field? So I began as a student in psychology, actually. And then I, it's kind of a funny story. I've told it uh, many, many times on, on podcasts. It's a common uh, question of interest, but Basically, I had a very terrifying nightmare that I, I woke up and I was so startled that I, I couldn't shake it. And I was just deeply interested in how my brain could even generate such an experience. And so it, my, my interests shifted from, you know, why people behave the way they do to this organ that is generating the, that behavioral output. And uh, I was afraid... I think I always wanted to study neuroscience, but I was afraid of the molecular biology and biochemistry and all of that. Um, you know, those those big graphs of signaling cascades, they always terrified me. And I thought, there's no way I could ever learn that. And and then this nightmare just changed everything where I, I woke up and I said, you know what, I think this is this is a deeply rooted interest that I just won't be able to shake. And, and I'm not sure a career in, in psychology as a researcher will meet that sort of passionate threshold for me to, to be excited every day. And so mm -hmm. I made the change and, and I'm really uh, happy I did. It worked out in the end. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's yeah, interesting yeah. how a personal experience can Always. completely shift one's life path um, into this. Dean and I, we both had, um, we say this on podcast too, and we've talked about it a lot. We both had grandparents and loved ones um, who had dementia. And, you know, we were, uh, we, we lived in, in households where taking care of a grandparent was a privilege. You know, it wasn't something that we completely separated ourselves from. So we saw these giants of human beings who were remarkable people, yeah. highly educated, very well-versed, just heroes of the family. They slowly and gradually lost parts of themselves to the point where they couldn't even recognize their family members or eat or bathe or, you know, clothe themselves. And it was so fascinating to see that shift um, and, and and that's why we both went into neurology to, well, initially with the idea that we were going to find a treatment for it, but 
you know, over the over the years and during our um, our experiences, we found out that it was very complex and nuanced. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, one of the things that we we love is um, uh, the the one of the topics that you're discussing, which we're actually experiencing in our fi family. Uh, it's the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, we see it in children in childhood. Actually, we have three family members that have kids that have autism. I'm going to dive into that. I mean, I know that that's an area of interest, an area of research for you. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, there's so much misinformation and confusion and fear around that. And, and that makes it both ripe for people to kind of abuse the, the situation, the, the charlatans out there. And also, it's such an important to topic to give clarity where there is information and an acceptance of where we need to grow into and not just, you know, just fill it with, with, with whatever we hear. So, um, autism is, is a massive disease. Um, and it's an umbrella category in many ways. I should, I'll, I'll let you kind of expand on that. Let's start by, uh, kind of telling us, uh, if you can, about your area of research and what, what, what do you know? What can you tell us about autism in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did my PhD research all on the genetics of autism specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, there, I, I, like you, I could talk for hours about <laughs> this. There's so much to say. But broadly, I'll introduce this by saying um, there are hundreds, at least 100 high-risk genes that if you have a mutation in that gene, you're at much stronger, a stronger increased risk for autism, for developing autism. And so, like I said, that's 100 high-risk genes. There are hundreds more that may be high risk, you know, that mutations are observed in those who have autism. Um, so it's, it's very, there's a strong genetic component. And as you mentioned, so autism is, it's autism spectrum disorder. It's a mm -hmm. spectrum. So um, I'm not a, a clinician. I don't see patients. I do all basic neuroscience research. Mm -hmm. So the research that I've been doing is, has been looking at the mechanisms of when you have one of those genetic mutations, what does that do to the brain? How, what sort of changes does that drive in the brain and how do those specific molecular synaptic changes whatever those are how are those changing social behavior so that's what i've been trying to understand and what i do my PhD research on um but it's you know not being a, a, a clinician being a scientist i have gone into um autism clinics and sat with neurologists and pediatric psychiatrists as they've screened children for autism and it's it's been very interesting to see and afterwards talking with them, you know, they've, they've told me once you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, you know, it's, it's a spectrum and, and the expression is so different in everyone. And so, um, it's really fascinating to me, you know, on the behavioral side of things that the diagnostic criteria for autism are social deficits and repetitive behaviors. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me because I got interested in, in neuroscience or when I started studying neuroscience, I was interested in social behavior and I still am. That's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to study. But it's interesting to me because social behavior is such a complex thing. There's so many pieces to it. There's so many brain systems involved. And then you have repetitive behaviors, which are very, very different. And it's intriguing to me that we often see two lumped together and that they've actually been purposely lumped together in the diagnostic criteria. So, um, there's many directions, so I'm happy to talk yeah. about whatever it is that you're interested in, in chatting about here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it, you're right. Uh, on a clinical level, there are some blunt behavioral end products or downstream behavioral product uh, outcomes that we describe as autism. And to me, it always felt uh, um, not just incomplete, but um, overgeneralized. Uh, uh, but... You know, I'm, I'm reading a few articles recently uh, about behaviors and the classical model of behavior versus the more um, 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 nuanced model that we're approaching where um, a behavior outcomes can be manifest in, in, from different areas of the brain. So there was a time, let me just simplify, we thought that the, the limbic system is emotion, the frontal lobe was logic, the, you know, and, and, and the left parietal for majority, 90 plus percent, it's language. But it's a little much more complex than that. It's not just areas, but systems that work together. And, and so to me need to, to look at that systems approach and then say, okay, repetitive behavior and then autism. And then you know that there's a whole spectrum of disease that actually is autism spectrum disorder was always uncomfortable. But I'm also circumspect and as a, I, you know, the, I think the humblest thing is science. 
I always say, okay, there's a thousand, maybe more, maybe 10,000 people doing autism research around the world. And I always feel awkward jumping in with my, I'm a neurologist, neuroscientist, but even then I'm very, very careful not overstating my knowledge. So given that, given that we, we know that there's probably some environmental factors, genetic factors, like uh, you talked about specific genes, but patterns of genes that are like RETS and Fragile X and, and uh, others and others. Do you have a good idea that, when, uh, not from a clinical perspective, that if one says that, uh, can one say that autism is not one disease or especially in this situation, or can, can you say that, no, at this point, yes, there's a hundred genes and a hundred manifestations, but you can still call it under one umbrella. That sounds very complex, but the point being, can we even call it a single disease now? Yeah, that's a great question. And something I think about all the time, you know, having studied, you know, coming from a, a kind of a different perspective where I'm studying the mechanisms first mm -hmm. and then learning about the brain systems. And as I'm learning about that, I'm also beginning to understand like what is autism? How, it, how is it clinically defined? And that perspective made me realize that it's, it's really interesting. Like exactly like you've said, there are hundreds of changes in the brain, all affecting different systems that all funder, fall into the same clinical classification of autism spectrum disorder. And so it's, it's amazing because like I said, there's like, let's say 100 high risk genes. You might think, okay, so those 100 high risk genes must all affect very similar functions in the brain, right? Maybe they're all the same class of protein. They're not. They're completely different. They all affect totally different things. And so perhaps we could subclassify them as, you know, these 10 affect this thing, these 20 affect this thing. And then from there, maybe start to subclassify autism spectrum disorder into different, um, you know, phenotypic, different brain changes. Uh, and who knows, maybe we would start to see that, okay, yeah, this classification makes sense. We see a lot of the same symptomology mm -hmm. in those patients. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way I look at it is that, like I said uh, before, social behavior is so complicated. There are so many pieces to it. You know, there's, you're, it's already a complicated and, and computationally challenging problem to think about what am I going to say? How am I going to express my words? You know, then you add the tone, then you add the body language, then you add the other person's tone and body language, then you add, you know, you're interjecting and cutting each other off and finding the appropriate space. Then if you have multiple people in a conversation, then it's like, okay, maybe this person is your boss versus your friend. There's so much to it. And so to be able to computationally process all of that requires so many distinct systems in the brain that if you have any like genetic mutation affecting any of those many systems, then it's going to present as some social anomaly, some sort of social deficit, which if also paired with a repetitive behavior will fall into the classification of autism. And Beautiful. So it, just for the audience, what, what Ben just said was basically we all have behavioral spectral disorder of some sorts. <laughs> I guess <laughs> yeah. so. I guess. I mean, if you put all the, and, and I, I'm completely on board with that. I'm completely, yeah. um, I, I, I completely agree with that. The, from the, from the level of sensing information to processing information, to integrating information, to then applying the information, then layering the information, then layering the information with another person, the level of complexity is not two to the, two to the eighth power. It's much more than that. And, and so none of us have, the, there is nobody who has the unique aspect of fully manifesting this behavior, behavioral uh, corticopia of behaviors in a proper way. That's not to diminish I want to step back. That's not to diminish what the families are experiencing with autism spectrum disorder, which is more, which, which, which is quite devastating for a lot of families really because really many is. of them, yeah. the child is not able to interact at all. So, so you actually opened up a whole <laughs> different direction than I expected from you. But, and I, but I, I love that complexity and the complexity that you're approaching, which is actually, I'm a behavioral neurologist and I'm, I'm now I have the luxury of sitting down and reading and going into another PhD and, and, and another uh, set of education on this concept that you're um, uh, doing amazing work on. Given what you just described and, and given the fact that in the next 10 to 15 years or 20 years, whatever, with AI and machine learning and large data, um, the, the autism might actually become something to the effect of behavioral disorder, five as, 
FG16, such and such, you know, uh, that level of classification. And it's that level of classification that involves each of those things describing um, sensing, processing, language, interacting, visual spatial, attention, all of those things, all those deficits or not even deficits, uh, all those anomalies or differences can actually be, be through large data analysis, be describing that autism spec disorder of one, the N of one. And I think we're going in that direction and that's incredibly valuable. Um, we have a conversation with the, the head of AI Academy uh, from Harvard uh, uh, next week or the following week. Right. And our two kids are both into AI They're in, uh, learning about it. Given that, do you think we're the you know with large data coming we're going into that level of specificity where we're defining diseases at the end of one level it could be i mean it's interesting I, it, the way you're essentially proposing is could psychiatrists be replaced by artificial intelligence oh as neurologists we already accept that <laughs> <laughs> it's over you're already throwing <laughs> it out said, uh, we're next we're <laughs> next and then neurosurgeons but yeah yeah that's i mean it's interesting you know there's a whole field of, of this type of research of, you know, personalized medicine and, and now enhancing um, diagnostic tools, right? So I know that there are there are technologies being developed that if you have some sort of, you know, it's I don't think it's out there yet, it's still in development, but if you have like a wellness app on your phone and you give permission to these apps in the future, it may be that they can listen to your tone. So when you're, mm -hmm. you know, hey, hey Siri, blah, blah, blah. Um, I hope my phone doesn't go off. Uh, or if you, you know, you're on the phone. Yeah, sorry if I set your phone off. No, no, the computer good. went off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad. Um, but you know, you're, or you're on the phone and you're saying stuff to your friends or whatever. It can detect changes in your tone of voice that may be able to predict um, depressive episodes yeah. and and things like that. You know, shifts in in psyche. And so it's it's likely that not only will we see more personalized medicine, but also maybe more personalized treatment and detection methods. I think. It, frankly, it it does scare me a little bit of, you know, I think these are very, very powerful tools. And I'm generally a little bit skeptical of policymakers that, you know, yeah. I hope they're used properly and I hope they're used cautiously. And um, and also not only that, you know, will they be overused? Will they be will will the power of them be overextended onto us? But actually, I'm also worried about the other direction. Is there going to be some extremely powerful tool that could save thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives, maybe could prevent suicides, and it will be blocked because it'll be viewed as an invasion of privacy when it actually could be a, a huge suicide prevention tool. Something like that. I just worry. I just hope that the voices of scientists and clinicians will be present when those decisions are made because they're certainly coming. No, Definitely. no, no. Sorry. Yeah. Whenever our conversations become, um, it vacillates like this, like this is happening, we're, we're it's actually out of the quality of this person we're speaking to because we're so excited about, I mean, we're going from ethics to large data analysis to my, you know, molecular uh, biology, molecular science. And, and we're right there. We're, we're, and you're right. I think in itself, let's, let me just step back in itself. Information is always good in itself. It's when limited, uh, Limited uh, uh, psychological perspectives, and, and the uh, uh, operative term here is limited, psychological perspectives put their ethics and morality onto this large data and information that becomes problematic. And that's always in the, been the, the mm -hmm. problem. And they, ironically and sadly, they are the ones that usually have power over that large data. And, I, and I'm scared of that as well. But the data itself, I mean, we're incredibly excited. Let's talk about the, the autism. Um, right now, you're one of the you know incredible scientists and Stanford doing beautiful work, amazing work, trying to figure out the molecular basis of it. And uh, these tools will help you open up this 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 thing into its full um, you know meaning and definition. But um, uh, and and uh, but as far as how the funding is going to come to you from you know uh, as being NIH, uh, I was at NIMDS for uh, three years and worked at um, uh, uh, dementia and Parkinson's and things like that. And, and I know the funding, the funding is controlled by politicians, by policymakers. So the overall, the overall amount that is decided, yeah. you know, they say, okay, we want to give who knows 
a billion dollars, I don't know, to autism research, you know, that that decision is is politically determined as far as I understand. But the actual determine a determination or the assessment of the individual research project, luckily, is made by scientists. Yes. Yeah. And I, yes. And yeah, thank I, goodness I, extra for that. Extramural funding. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I want to know uh, what are some of the advances um, in research on autism that you are working on at Stanford University? Mm -hmm. What is the next frontier that scientists are working on? So that's a good question. Um, there are many different components. I mean, I think that the autism field is kind of fragmented where there are mm -hmm. people studying genetics and behavior in mice. And that's actually what I was doing previously in my PhD. Um, then there are, of course, human research projects. I think so far what we, uh, what, what has been observed in mice, you know, observationally, it seems to line up pretty well with what is observed in humans, which is good. It's good news, of course. But the problem is that, you know, it seems like every month or so a paper comes out you know, where someone, uh, some group of scientists does some manipulation, you know, changes the certain region, a brain region, increases the activity or decreases the activity or something. Mm -hmm. And it makes a mouse model, we call them mouse models of autism, mm -hmm. um, meaning a mouse with a genetic mutation, let's say, mm -hmm. associated with autism. It makes them more social. And so every month or so, it's like, awesome, there's potentially a new treatment on the horizon. Maybe we can translate this to humans. And 0% of it translates, never yeah. ever translates. So I think, um, you know, the next horizon may be trying to integrate, you know, all of this very detailed understanding we have of the molecular basis of autism spectrum disorder and many of these thing, observations we made in mice and in other species, you know, um, zebrafish and stuff, even looking at social interactions and zebrafish, things like that, and, and really trying to push it forward um, to translate into to helping those with autism who would be interested in treatments. And that's also, I mean, again, sorry to divert into a whole other thing, but being on social media and talking about autism, I've learned that there is really a, a varied response, a public response to talking about this idea of advancing treatments for autism. Because right now there are no treatments available for the social symptoms of autism. Mm -hmm. And um, when you say something <clears throat> like, like when I go on and I talk about my research, you know, potentially leading to a d treatment for autism, there are some people who say, you know, it's it's horrible that you even would even propose that there sh that autism should be treated, right? And then there are other people who say this is something that would really, really help my family. You know, please, how can I how can I help your research? And it's a very sensitive topic. And I think also just in general for for your viewers to be aware of, um, not everyone who is on the spectrum wants treatment or mm -hmm. should be treated. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a there's. It's again, it's a spectrum. Some people who have autism, they, they see it as a superpower, you know, from, again, this yeah. is only from my interactions. I can't speak for those with autism. I, I don't actually have any relatives on the spectrum, but some view it as a superpower. And for others, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's debilitating for the family. It's debilitating for the, the interactions with the parents and the family members. And I'm sure there are many people, you know, who um, would opt for a treatment if it were available. But uh, with that said, you know, I'm, I, I do my research just sort of trying to understand the, the biology. And mm -hmm. oftentimes we do these mechanistic studies where we're, we're looking at something and we say, okay, there's a change in the brain. You know, in order to be doing, in order to do rigorous science, we want to ask um, necessity and sufficiency. If we reverse that change in the brain, will it reverse the behavior? It allows us to more strongly tie that change to the behavior. And so we often do those studies and that naturally, if, if it does reverse the behavior, it naturally leads into this being a potential target for treatments. And um, so that's, anyways, sorry for the diversion, but no, it's, no, a, it's, no, not, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not. exactly what we're experiencing in our field, with, uh, whether it's Alzheimer's yeah. or stroke, uh, that, uh, hundreds of models, uh, mice models have worked. And every week there's another paper that comes out, oh, uh, you know, Alzheimer's model of uh, um, uh, the mouse model, a uh, transgenic model, uh, well, this drug helped um, reverse the, the memory problems. And none of them have translated. Mm -hmm. None of them have ever translated. And and not th and that neg doesn't negate the molecular research. It just um, we at some point we have to kind of step back and kind of look at um, different models as well. Um, and and that's why I'm again not to belabor this point, but one I'll say it one more time. I'm very much for these um, large data and and m uh, larger models, computerized models of behavior that uh, as as it manifests, it just becomes much more clear. 
And um, yeah, that's that's yeah. Uh, that's uh, p- positive and optimistic. It sounds exciting, some t- somewhat frightening too, <laughs> but exciting for the most part. And I, I feel that studying diseases like um, autism spectrum disorder mm-hmm. actually enables scientists, your field, Ben, to understand the brain better and how it functions and the complexity of human behavior in itself. So it's it's a fantastic opportunity to learn more about the brain. I want to tie in the the this this conversation, which is relevant to the concept of um, research and sometimes some errors that we see along the way. Um, I really appreciated one of your posts recently about um, you challenging the idea that there was it was in the news and we talked about it. You know how the amyloid model of Alzheimer's disease. The fact that it was fabricated, that it is all false. I mean, the whole social the media went nuts about that one particular finding. And um, <clears throat> I th- we made a post about it. We had a conversation about it. And I saw you agreeing with the whole concept, too, that, yes, maybe there were some errors and some fabrications, but it doesn't negate the large amount of information that we have gathered from years of research on the fact that amyloid is associated with neurodegenerative disorders. I'd like for you to kind of highlight that because I think it's relevant. Yes, along the way, we make some errors and mistakes, but it doesn't mean that it was all wrong. Totally, yeah. So <clears throat> it's it's funny because this was a huge story in science, you know, and I, because I tend to view science and the rest of the world as distinct channels, right? Science sort of has its own, we publish in our journals and we kind of are very closed off and I don't like that. I think it should be very different, but, mm-hmm. um, what I'm getting at is for scientists, the media channels that you interact with and the stories you hear about are often completely separate from what the, you know, things you see on Twitter and, and on the news. And so in science, it was its own story. There, there was an article published about it, about the retraction and, and the paper um, that was fabricated. And, and so for, and for context, for listeners, there was a paper, I, I forget it was 2006, you know, 2006. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they showed it was one of the the in, initial foundational studies showing that um, amyloid beta plaques are are associated with uh, mm-hmm. Alzheimer's, uh, and and it turned out that some images in that study were fabricated. They were you know they were sh- showing data that was not real. And so when that was discovered, what had happened was in science in the channel the science channel of the world it was this is no good. Everyone, there's fabricated data. The papers retracted. Um, you know, everyone keep this in mind when continuing your research, uh, on amyloid beta plaques specifically. And, but, you know, just know that maybe the, the, these data in this paper are false, but in the non-science, the media channel, it was every bit of Alzheimer's research that we've done in the last 16 years is completely false. It was this, it was an explosion and having, you know, being a person who is on social media, very active on TikTok and Instagram. I saw both channels and I was seeing absolutely no alarm from my colleagues in science Mm -hmm. and nothing but alarm in the public. And it was really, really challenging to see. And so there was, you know, one video in particular that I ended up um, stitching, it's called, where I I replied to it on TikTok, where this person was saying, you know, everything we know is fabricated and 16 years of research are down the drain and all the studies are are garbage. and, And so all these billions of dollars in drugs targeting amyloid beta are, um, are, you know, it's all worthless. All the money sunk. And it's just frustrating because, you know, what, what the real meaning of this paper was, is that basically there was one specific, uh, like isoform of amyloid beta is like a 56 kilodalton protein. And that, that's what it was focusing on. It was showing that, you know, this one type of amyloid beta plaque was involved. Um, and forgive me, I can't give you the specifics on that. I didn't read the paper very recently, but take that paper out of the equation, look at all the remaining evidence. There's still yeah. plenty of evidence suggesting that amyloid beta plaques are, are involved in Alzheimer's. You know, there's human studies. If you take postmortem slices of human brain tissue from patients or from those with or without Alzheimer's, there's clearly much more amyloid beta in the brains of, of those with Alzheimer's. And that just, for instance, or genetic mutations affecting, yeah. um, you know, the amyloid beta pathway uh, are more, inc- increase your risk for Alzheimer's. So it's it was frustrating to see um, this real misrepresentation of what was a real problem in science, this fabricated paper, but it was overblown. And it's and it's always just brings up this certain awareness within me where I think, you know, it's not the public's fault for 
listening to the people on TikTok talking about this or, you know, or not being able to discern the validity of, of that claim that all of this Alzheimer's research is in the garbage. Um, it's, it's really the fault of the people who are taking this opportunity to overblow it and misrepresent it. And that's exactly what we were talking about earlier, that there's so much incentive to say, look at me, everyone, I understand this topic and Alzheimer's research is a waste and it's a huge controversy, especially that people love controversy and, and bad news. And it was just sort of the perfect storm. And what was really unfortunate was it also happened right around the time of the, uh, the review that came out suggesting that low serotonin is not the cause of depression. And mm -hmm. that happened like just with, I think it was a, only a few days apart. And that had the same type of response, um, which I was also frustrated by. So, and I can talk about that if you want, but if not, no worries. Yeah, yeah no, worries. absolutely. I mean, that's definitely an interest. Um, we, 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 we actually, when we were doing research at UCSD, which was the main neuroscience program with Leon Thal, was my mentor, um, and everything was amyloid. Everything. I mean, um, um, uh, Paul, um, um, uh, the, the especially when you were doing your fellowship. I mean, that yeah. was just the main. Two thousand six. Yeah. Um, er everybody was focusing on neuroimmunology and same drug trial after drug trial. Thousands of brains, and they have the largest brain bank. And I'm, I was looking at the pathology, and Aisha was looking at the imaging. Everything. Amyloid. 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 And and we were a little incredulous of of the over overstatement, over reliance. Uh, of one model, um, uh, yes, there's plenty of information. I mean, the the early onset Alzheimer's the, is all amyloid driven. Uh, whether it's pre cell and one, pre cell and two, APP, it's all amyloid driven. And if you look at the familial models, which used to come to NIH and others, all amyloid driven. And even the rest, they're downstream amyloid dependent. Um, um, uh, so even the APOE4 or the, the inflammatory pathways or the, um, all of them, the, the 30 plus or 40 plus now genes that have been associated, um, they have a relationship with amyloid. It's not a binary concept. The problem is that humanity, because it needed to determine if the thing moving behind the bush was a tiger or not, is absolutist. It, it wants certainty. And there's nothing more calming, comforting than certainty. So if a scientist comes and says, you know, it's, it might be this, but there's a percentage of this. But if you look at the logistics and there you put the, the exponents on the right, that you have to, that will put people to sleep. And, and that's why uh, internet's taken over by people that just go all out. Mm -hmm. I mean, here are the five ways you can survive, whatever. <laughs> uh, so yep. you're, you're absolutely right that we have to be circumspect. And if we can, and I think this is where my hope is. I'm getting some. My hope is that we, as humans become comfortable with the wave of information or the cluster of information becoming more and more complex. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's, a, there's a whole book about consciousness being the, the, the evolution of language. And as, as the clusters of language become more complex, population moves with this more complex clusters of language. Not to give you, uh, Aisha says, you give people some, but no, to flattery, a, you people like you and hopefully us as well and others as well, are moving this cluster of complexity forward. Maybe we don't have information, but comfort with the more complex cluster of language. That's basically it. And that's important because when the population becomes comfortable with a with, with little bit of uncertainty or more, then we will have more of the social media, more of the science being moved in that direction. We had a hard time even bringing up lifestyle um, um, uh, to, to Loma Linda, even though some of the best people, um, Elizabeth Barrett Connor, um, 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 the Stein Aging Institute, all of them were doing some great work on lifestyle and brain health. It was very difficult. So when you uh, bringing this language, it's critical, it's very important. So let's get into the serotonin one, which you're right, that's actually what I've been looking at as well. All of a sudden, everybody's now throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Would love yeah. to hear your perspective. Yeah, this is this is a one of my favorite topics to to talk about, um, which is funny because I don't study depression, but I've I've read up on it a lot with this. So let me let me start with maybe an introduction for for your yeah. listeners to be great. depression. So um, uh, in the fifties, there was a drug that was being used to treat tuberculosis. It's kind of a cool story, and they were giving it to the patients, and they found that an unusual side effect that everyone was very happy. Everyone was very content when taking these drugs. Um, turns out they were um, MAO 
inhibitors. Yeah. MAL. Yeah, I'm just thinking it's yeah. MOA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mono yeah. amino oxidase. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. And so, which which means that they increase levels of of broadly serotonin, do- dopamine, norepinephrine. And so, later on, it was found that if you give people drugs that instead of affecting all of those systems, only affect serotonin, only increase serotonin signaling in the brain, then they also produce these same effects. And so, and they also have the fewer side effects. And they thought, great, well, this is perfect for it could be used for an antidepressant. So they started being prescribed. And there were initially some some studies suggesting that serotonin levels were lower in the brains and bodies of those who were diagnosed with depression. And so it made perfect sense. It was this clear story, right? Okay, well, if you have low serotonin, then you have depression. If you boost serotonin with an SSRI, it reverses the depression. Perfect. Nice and simple. And so, and then apparently, you know, I wasn't around for this, but apparently there was presented as sort of, you know, chem- serotonin or uh, sorry, depression is caused by a chemical imbalance. Low serotonin is the problem. If you increase it, then you re- reverse the problem. And it turns out that in the following several decades, the research that was done to confirm that hypothesis just did not pan out. There was really? repeatedly very pretty pretty clear evidence that you know there's no actual evidence for lower serotonin in depression. And so over over time the researchers in the field of depression began to understand this and it was okay, probably this low serotonin theory is not true, but it was never like presented to the public in terms of, oh, hey, everyone, you should probably not believe that anymore. Um, but scientists knew very, very well. And it's funny because I actually did a the TikTok video on depression like last year at some point and I was reviewing the literature and I found that and I said, oh, that's weird. You know, I kind of thought that low serotonin was definitely going to be implicated in depression. Again, I'm not a, ser- or not a d- depression researcher, so I found it, though, and I thought, okay, well, that's what the literature says, so there's no low serotonin. Turns out a paper came, came out in June or July where they did exactly what I did. They reviewed all the literature, and they presented, hey, look at this. We can pretty, we'd say pretty certainty, certainly now that there is no evidence for low serotonin in depression. And when that hit the media, it was the exact same thing, where scientists were not surprised. It was just kind of what we had already known if we were paying attention to the literature, but the media blew up and it was like, it was completely misrepresented. It was really brutal. I, and I actually stitched a clip on TikTok of um, Tucker Carlson saying, you know, this is like the number one show on TV, Tucker Carlson. He's saying, we now just found out that SSRIs don't work as intended. And, you know, they, they never actually treated what we thought they did, which is such an over extrapolation because just because now there's evidence that low serotonin isn't the cause doesn't mean that SSRIs don't work. You know, there's still plenty of evidence. There's always been that SSRIs can successfully treat depression mm-hmm. in many patients, not all, but many. And it was just so dangerous. And I thought, wow, holy cow, how many people are, uh, who are taking SSRIs are going to watch this program where Tucker Carlson says, you know, SSRIs no longer work what you've been told is a lie and stop taking their SSRIs. And as you may know, there can be withdrawal effects. You know, you can have yeah. really severe withdrawal effects, especially if you stop cold turkey. Yeah. And that was, it was just brutal to see. And, and once again, it's, it's really sort of this issue where scientists, like you said, they, they want to speak with uncertainty. They want to sur- speak cautiously. And so for a scientist to come out publicly two years ago and say, there's no evidence for serotonin, or low serotonin and depression, it would have been a pretty bold statement without like a clear paper to cite, right? And now someone can come out and say that and they can cite that review paper that came out. But it's sort of like this this disconnect between science and the public where until there's concrete evidence, nobody wants to really talk about anything um, that's sort of uncertain. And so you end up with with the public believing things that were maybe believed in the scientific community 10 years ago. But since then, there's been a massive change. And it was just this beautiful example, an ugly example, I should say of how disconnected the public can be from science and, and how much yeah. better of a job we need to do <clears throat> communicating the current research. And just like you said, you know, that will involve uncertainty, that will in- involve complicated messaging, um, and that will also involve you know, the, the public to understand that really what science is and, and how science incrementally grows closer to a thorough understanding of something, but is never entirely concrete. And yeah. um, if, if we can embrace that, then I think it opens the door for, for scientists to do more effective public messaging in places like TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, no, I, th- th- that's so beautifully stated. I mean, um, the serotonin model is not thrown out. We just know more complexity. It's uh, if you uh, we saw this in in, in dopamine with um, uh, 
at NINDS where they brought these patients uh, with, which had the first group of uh, stem cells placed in the basal ganglia. So initially thought dopamine loss, so give dopamine. But it's not that. It's the tonic, a perfect amount of dopamine release. If it's excess, you get these incredible dyskinesias, which is one of the worst things you ever want to see, Ben. I mean, I, I had these patients in the ward and I, I'm getting emotional 20 years later. Um, they would lose two, three pounds a day from the movements and they would break bones. And because we gave them dopamine, but in excess, and, and it wasn't something that we gave them with a pill, it was in their body. Same thing with serotonin. It's, it's not just the amount of serotonin or lack of it. It's the tonic release. It's the postsynaptic downregulation of receptor kind of a thing. It's a beautiful, complex model that science slowly becomes more and more aware of it in its complexity. But the conversation should be had that that's how science moves in small increments. Just because the Newtonian model was not ju so much juxtaposed, but um, you know, added on to with the with the you know um, um, uh, the the nuclear and um, uh, the the quantum physics, it didn't negate Newtonian physics. Try jumping from a building; Newtonian physics will will confirm itself. You know. It's just, it's just come, don't jump up from the way anywhere, please. Right. So I don't want anybody to do it. <laughs> it just is layers of complexity being built and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a picture within a picture, within a picture, within a picture, as you grow out of it and it becomes more into it. It's such a beautiful concept if, if we can, and, and hopefully people listening to you and others that we know that just, right makes this language more palatable. I want to touch on that, actually. So it feels really good to talk to people like Ben. And, you know, when we speak with each other, there's a tacit understanding that there are a lot of things that we don't know and that we have made a promise to ourselves that we are going to tell the truth, but we also will, um, you know, look at the bigger context. So, you know, your language, the way you speak is always in the context of the bigger picture. There are no absolutes. Mm -hmm the specific words that we choose to convey a message, the whole idea of scientific communication mm -hmm. is something that is very important for us, Ben, and I see that in you as well. But for people, like you said, it can be really difficult. And I think that kind of gives us a window of how the human mind works. When it comes from a place of certainty and authority, whether it's real or not, it sticks very well and it kind of you know, produces this kind of fuzzy, warm feeling like, oh, I'm listening to someone who knows what they're talking about. I'm so glad about. you didn't say dopamine release. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, what, what, so my question, I suppose, is for a regular person who does not really have any background in science, and I have loved ones, I have my entire patient population who don't necessarily have a background in science, mm -hmm. but they're inundated with these self-proclaimed specialists and, and experts in brain health. I mean, there's so many of them, Ben. You probably know yeah. them by person. You you probably have seen their messages. And we're kind of like tired, you know, breaking myths and kind of clarifying things on a regular basis. What do you suggest that a regular person without a scientific background mm -hmm. should do to, to live in a world where complexity is at its core? And for them to navigate making the best decisions for themselves yeah. and not get swayed by the hype of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful question. I mean, I think the the simple answer would be, oh, you know, just do the research, right? Look into it further. But it's not always easy to find the answer. And, you, you know, and it's even in science. If, if you're a person who only goes to PubMed or Google Scholar and only looks at peer-reviewed scientific literature for your information, which is, I happen to be one of those people, call yeah. me crazy. But if you are, even still, you can always find, you know, here's a paper with with one supporting one theory, here's a paper supporting the other theory. You know, there's there's limited evidence, there's limited data. Um, I think, so that's like the simple kind of clear answer, but I don't think that's the true, the right answer. I think that, sure, if we can inform the public on how to like find better sources of information, that's great. But in the end, I think, People need to just be comfortable with like not lying to themselves about information and just sort of and not accepting things because they sound true. And it's it's such a complicated situation to navigate because another solution could be, you know, go to on social media, follow people like like you two and me and others who have credentials. But 
just because you have a PhD doesn't necessarily mean you always know everything about everything. I mean, if you have a PhD and you're present, like if you're me, I'm on the internet presenting myself as a neuroscientist, I better be doing a, a careful job of sourcing my information and, mm -hmm. and, you know, peer reviewing myself before I put it out there. But um, not everyone does that. And so I think it's, if, if you're looking for tips, for example, right, you're, you're looking for how can I improve my life, my well-being, and you hear something on the on TikTok about, you know, specialist says something, try it and see if it works. If it works for you, wonderful. That's great. If it doesn't work for you, then don't do it. You know, it's it's like this absolutism that you've talked about. It's not always this or that. You know, it's all it, it's just a matter of being okay with information sometimes being wrong and being okay with sometimes the information you believe being wrong and just sort of being comfortable with drawing closer to a accurate understanding of something, you know, and yeah. I think it's so tough because, you know, part of what I'm kind of saying here is like, oh, don't trust experts, right? But yeah. it's like, uh, sometimes you can't distinguish what's a, tr a good expert and a bad expert on the internet. You know, there's plenty of people who look just like me, have the same credentials as me on the internet, who are giving out bad information. And I see it all the time. And it, yeah. it's really frustrating. Um, I think maybe what we need to do is, uh, as sort of a field, work with social media platforms on, you know, if you can develop complicated AI algorithms to, to do <laughs> all, all this fancy stuff. You know, I'm sure you can develop something to, to do a fact check and put a little asterisk on something, you know, Hey, this is not yeah. true. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. Ben, but, it was so funny. You brought that up. So we have weird <laughs> conversations in our family. My son, um, graduated from college. He's, he's young uh, you, and he's, he's very, very good with AI stuff. And yeah, he actually programmed a cognitive game. Uh, for he us. actually tells you not to use the phrase AI. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> a like, good sign. Dad, don't, don't yeah. say AI. Yeah, don't. don't it's, <laughs> it's overused. Overused. Um, uh, so we're talking about this algorithmic approach yeah. to uh, to fact checking, uh, and then putting appropriate weights, and then the final conclusion would be so the language would be so self contained and self uh, you know uh, checking that that uh, that it would be the closest thing that you could come to a fairly valid language. Yeah, that's something that will come, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it will become self-curating language for the highest level of validity and utility. Those two things that we usually uh, talk about, validity without utility and vice versa, it doesn't make sense. The other thing I say is, I mean, there's very difficult, it's very difficult. I, I've known people who are MD, PhD, that I'm, I mean, I, I have multiple degrees, it doesn't mean anything. I say, when you talk to me, throw away my degrees. And the thing that's coming out of my mouth, am I making it clear enough? Am I making, am I checking myself enough? And, and please challenge my, my, my statements. And if I, if you hear me speak on TikTok or social media or whatever, if I'm actually speaking in a circumspect way, in a way where I'm actually questioning myself often, then, then you believe in person's validity. Um, one of the things we do is, and it's a very uncomfortable thing, and I'm, I'm going to even make it uncomfortable here. We've done it a couple of times. We're vegans. And we're vegans for environment, for animals. We don't push that on anybody. That's, that's us. And, but when it comes to the science, we say, you know, fish, there's no evidence that fish is bad for you. And this has made, this has been very difficult for a lot of the people that follow us and so on and so forth. Science is science. The data shows this and we have to go with that. And, and I, I, I would hope that that would actually give people solace. The fish doesn't give the fish solace. I'm, I'm going to tell people don't do it. The oceans are dying. Da -da. But. It would give them solace that the information that comes from us is not a bias driven. Everybody's got biases. Mm -hmm. You cannot open your mouth without some measure of bias unless you have some awareness of your bias and you're checking your biases. And, and if people come and speak, and that's why we, when we heard several of your talks, you speak in very uh, circumspect uh, and, and calm manner as it pertains to, this, to, uh, to information. And that's why I think people should follow people like you and others because they're not propagating their a priori uh, biases, but hopefully standing for the latest truth as it manifests itself. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. And and yeah, absolutely. Because this is another thing I was going to say. Like when I said, don't lie to yourself about information. I mean, there are scientists, ideally every scientist should be objective like this, right? Yeah. Look at the data. That's what the answer is. But th I've seen scientists who, you know, let's say, they publish a paper and they've built an entire story on this one finding. And then something comes out that says that's not true, you know, and they, and they, and suddenly what they thought was like their contribution to science is unraveling before them. And sometimes those people refuse to accept that they're wrong. Right. 
And it's and that's a tough situation because you know, this is a person who you'd hope to be objective, but of course they have a tie to the data. Um, and and sometimes you just see that you know they refuse to believe that that they are wrong. And of course this is also applicable to anyone in in not outside of science, right? Many people refuse to believe that they could be wrong about anything. But you know my my current um, a scientist that I work with, he's he's my supervisor. His name is Rob Malenka. He's a, a notorious neuroscientist. He's known for characterizing a lot of what we know about synaptic plasticity. And he, his perspective is unbelievable. He's taught me so much because whenever we find something, we, you know, we, we are as rigorous and careful as we can be in, ex in our experiments. We, you know, we do multiple tests. We show that like, definitely this has to be what's happening. And he'll come out openly and just say, I, I hope it's true. You know, I don't know. I, I still, even with all the evidence we could possibly have, we yeah. don't know it's true. Right. And so yeah. if he's, if he's questioned, you know, he just falls back and we did every test we can. And we think, you know, all the evidence aligns in one place, but he will, he would never publish, you know, if we had one experiment suggesting it's true and another suggesting it's not, he would never publish that because he knows in his heart, that's not true. And I think the, having that ability to say, you know, to personally detach from the need to be yeah. right and just objectively look and say, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I've done everything I can to, to, to make this as accurate as I can, you know, to make my presentation as valid as possible. I think that is, is a tremendous ability. And, uh, I try to model myself after him as much as I can. Beautiful. Just to add to that, good. this is beautiful. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that ex example because it tells, uh, people who are not in the field of science, um, about, you know, just the energy that exists in a lab or in a clinic and how people come up with their statements that they're so they're so cautious before they make an objective statement but let's look at the other end of the spectrum as well um so things like you know you sure yeah he's so we got to i'm going to end it up because i know yeah i'm going to say something right huh? Okay, one no, 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 one no. last statement. Yeah. Really? I, don't, I think he needs. Okay. Um, someone you, you needs don't... this room. I can move to no, another no, no. room. We were almost done. We'll do. Uh, uh, if you're open to it, we'll do many other conversations uh, together on your podcast and vice versa. Okay. Um, I had one final question for today. Today, uh, did you watch the World Cup? <laughs> I did not. Oh, uh, you're not a soccer fan? I'm not. I'm not. But it does sound really cool. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Okay, good. No, no, I'm, I'm just no. But um, I was, I was going to bring some uh, questions about the the, the Argentina win, but that's okay. We'll we'll leave that for another time. What what? Uh, but this is wonderful. It's uh, it was wonderful speaking to you, um, and I uh, would love to have many other conversations because we had a whole list of things to talk about. But uh, thank you so much but for for making the time. Where can people find you? Can you give your uh, information on your handle so that people can follow you? Yep, best place would just be to go right to my website. It's my name, benrein.com. So it's B-E-N-R-E-I-N.com. That's my, everything's on there. But yeah, thank I you so much it. for having me. And I'm definitely open to doing more conversations. There's a lot to talk about. Likewise, Absolutely. there's a lot to talk about. Have a wonderful day, Ben. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, you thank too. You, thank you so much.